Welcome back to Recap with me, QQ, and video producer Johnny D. Another week crammed full of stuff to talk about. Let's get straight to ethics and games journalism, why don't we? Well, actually, you see, it is about ethics in games journalism. So, some dig results came out recently. A person going by the handle Boogie Pop Robin started digging into a video games journalist named Kara Ellison. Ellison currently writes for Vice, Rock Paper Shotgun, The Guardian, The Yearbook Office, The New Statesman, and more. In the past, they've written for PC Gamer, IGN, and Giant Bomb. Sounds like a freelancer to me. Anyway, these things about Ellison just kept coming out, thanks to Bookie Pop Robin. First, Ellison wrote about game developer Anna Anthropy in full articles for Rock Paper Shotgun and The Guardian. She then name-dropped her in an article in Vice. What was not disclosed is that they probably had some kind of personal relationship. This can easily be seen from their Twitter messages to each other. Ellison and Anthropy had had dinner together multiple times, they hung out and played board games together, and perhaps most concerning, they had a financial relationship too. There was also some sappy romantic sounding stuff for the muckraker in all of us. None of this was disclosed in any of the articles. So here we have it. This sounds even worse than what Nathan Grayson did that kicked this whole thing off. But wait, there's more. Boogie Pop Robin kept digging into Ellison and found that she'd written multiple articles featuring indie developer Porpentine, without disclosing that they had worked together at Rock Paper Shotgun. These were published in many publications. The ones that she did not disclose their business relationship in were in PC Gamer and IGN. In the IGN one, she named Porpentine's game as the number one best free game about sex out of all six mentioned. <laughs> wait, wait, stop for one moment. Porpentine's twine games are the gentry in terms of sophistication. Porpentine's twine games are the gentry in terms of sophistication? Holy crap! Someone needs to hop in a time machine back to the 70s and play some Zork. One of the early pieces of interactive fiction makes a mockery of any twine game in terms of sophistication. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. When we pointed out Nathan Grayson's failure to disclose business relationships, it was dismissed because, oh, they didn't just work for the same publication but never really interacted, blah 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 blah. In Ellison's case, we have proof to the contrary in the form of their Twitter history. There were quite a few messages between them. Some of them were silly and sappy, but the smoking gun was an exchange that proved they had a working relationship, with Ellison collaborating with Porpentine to publish one of Porpentine's articles on the Rock Paper Shotgun website. So there we have it, even more nepotism from- But wait, there's even more! Kara Ellison wrote six, count them, six articles about Gone Home. Wait, how do you get six articles worth of content out of Gone Home? It's not a very long game. You could probably finish it in less time than it takes to write six articles. It's almost like Ellison wanted so many articles so it could hit as many publications as possible. In one of them, she interviewed Steve Gaynor, founder of the Fulbright Company that made Gone Home, where he pretended to be a Christmas duck from the game. Wait, what? But I'm sure there's good professional distance between Ellison and Steve Gaynor, right? I mean, it's not like Kara was asking if she could hang out with him. Like they were partying together in hotel rooms, like they were exchanging gifts, or like Steve was donating to Ellison's Patreon or anything. Oh wait, they were doing all of those things. So what do you do when a freelancer is caught being worse than Nathan Grayson? Now that's a badge of dishonor. Kara Ellison, worse than Nathan Grayson. Since she appears to be a freelancer, she can't exactly be fired, but any publication paying her in the future should know that she has a habit of improper disclosure and that she's likely to damage their brand if she does it again. That's why Operation Deep Freeze is so important. There needs to be a website out there that chronicles these journalists' terrible behavior so that they can be held accountable for their actions in the future. Thank you, Boogie Pop Robin, for your awesome digging. More ethical breaches on the way! Ubisoft has a group for girl gamers called Fragdolls. They use it as a PR vehicle for their diversity initiatives. Eliza Melendez is a journalist who used to work for Ubisoft as part of the Fragdolls. So naturally, if she ever writes about Ubisoft, and especially Ubisoft's diversity initiatives, she should offer a disclosure, right? I mean, that's just common sense. Well, you'd think so, but we know better when it comes to games journalists now, don't we? Here she is, writing for Fusion.net. The article name drops Ubisoft and appears to be trying to take some of the heat off them for the lack of female playable assassins in Assassin's Creed Unity. This one's even more blatant. It's a puff piece about how cool Ubisoft's E3 presentation was. 
Wait, Polygon 2? Say it ain't so. Polygon is supposed to be a bastion of ethical journalism, right? I mean, having a former member of a Ubisoft diversity PR wing write about diversity in Assassin's Creed Liberation and Black Flag should be disclosed, right? How is she getting away with all this? Well, it should surprise nobody that she's part of the Cool Kids Club. She chats with that indie dev on Twitter and was part of Arthur Chu's MAGFest panel on Gamergate. So welcome to games journalism, folks, where all of your sins and transgressions are washed away as long as you know the right people. On the social media front, there are a lot of small developments, so I'll touch on each one briefly. Roberto Rosario, former chairman of the late IGDA Puerto Rico, reopened his Twitter account and confirmed some of our worst fears. He told a story about how he was called a misogynist by people opposed to Gamergate. What were his crimes? Well, he condemned Georgie Tate's remarks calling for a second holocaust for Gamergate supporters. And he protested his inclusion on the GG Autoblocker blocklist and criticized the very principle behind the blocklist. For those crimes, he was labeled a misogynist and found himself blacklisted from certain events until he could clear things up. But remember, folks, the block lists are not intended to be industry blacklists, right? Moving on. Want a good example on how not to do PR for your game? Create a conflict of interest by insulting a game reviewer. So Total Biscuit was not fond of the game Titan Souls. He made a tweet saying that it did not appeal to him. Andrew Gleason an artist for the game and paragon of maturity, decided to call him Toilet Biscuit on Twitter. Total Biscuit was not amused, and his lack of amusement was coloring his perceptions of the game, so he decided to recuse himself and not make a video review. Good job, Total Biscuit. Ethics plus plus. Next, both Milo Yiannopoulos' and Niche Gamer's applications to E3 were accepted. Congratulations, folks. I know I shouldn't celebrate it, but out of pure schadenfreude, NeoGAF was rejected because they do not appear to be an active media outlet with ongoing coverage of the interactive entertainment industry. Sorry guys, I guess echo chambers aren't press outlets. Finally, Camera Lady and Dev made another indefensible. It's titled Oh Boy Boye, and it's about Brandon Boye and the IGF. It's excellent and you should watch it. Now it's time for ethics. I'm going to talk about what happened to the Honey Badger Brigade at the Calgary Comic and Entertainment Expo. There's something that I have to disclose first. I paid 25 bucks to the Honey Badgers as part of their fundraising campaign to get them to the con. This is bound to make my perceptions of the event there biased in favor of their presence being allowed. You should treat this segment as what it is. An editorial from a backer containing that backer's perceptions on the event. So again, this will seem a bit tangential at first, but Gamergate is involved, I promise. Let me start out by introducing the Honey Badgers. The Honey Badger Brigade is a group of artists and techies and just general nerds who produce podcasts, animations, illustrations, comedy, comics, fiction, and so on. They are pro-freedom of expression, against politicizing attitudes of female victimhood, and advocate for men's issues. That last bit might sound a bit scary to some of you, I'm sure. Yes, they are advocates for men's issues. MRAs a term that's often used as a pejorative. But if you listen to their podcast, you'll quickly find that they do not meet the fedora-tipping, pickup artist, red pillar stereotype that advocates for men's issues tend to get tarred with. In fact, the person who came up with the idea for the Honey Badgers, Alison Tiemann, is a woman, and generally you'll hear more women's voices on the podcast than men's. That was one of my motivations behind paying to get them to the conference. The people that they are and the things that they say and do are simply narrative-shattering. Of course, now I will be branded as an evil MRA who rapes kitten smoothies. Go right ahead, I stopped caring what I'm labeled as after what went down at the Calgary Expo. So what exactly did go down at the Calgary Expo? Well, the Honey Badger Brigade had a booth there. It was funded partially through crowdfunding, with a little over nine grand coming from their fans. And it was partially funded out of pocket, with Karen Strawn, Mike Stevenson, and Allison Tiemann kicking in 62000 bucks to attend. Their mission statement was simple. Let me read part of it off of their fundraising page. As men's issues advocates and defenders of creators' rights to create unmolested, that's what we have to say to the nerds and geeks and gamers. You are fantastic as you are. Carry on. Basically, they wanted a booth where they could advocate against censorship. Their booth was selling Honey Badger merchandise and merchandise related to Allison Tiemann's comic, Xenospora. It also served as a place for fans and people curious about the message of their podcast to meet them and talk with them. Oh, wait, wait, no, oh, no, no, there's the Gamergate logo uh, in their merchandise. And, and there's Vivian James. Oh, don't they know? Don't they know that us Gamergaters are worse than men's issue advocates? Worse than ISIS? 
And sure enough, on the second day of their convention, there was a Twitter storm about it. There were tweets claiming that the pro Gamergate stuff was about supporting harassment, which the Calgary Expo official Twitter account noticed. The reaction didn't take long. I checked before I ate, and the Twitter storm had started. I checked after I ate, and the Honey Badgers had been kicked out already, and somehow there was already an article on the Mary Sue about it. Now things get a little bit hazy. The Calgary Expo made some announcements, deleted them, then made other announcements. The first reason given was that they were disrupting panelists. This was shown to be false when the Honey Badgers released audio of the panel in question. It was a discussion-style panel. They asked for permission to speak, spoke, and then ceded the floor when someone else wished to speak. Then the Expo changed their story and claimed they were kicked out due to reasons given in the Mary Sue article. They've since deleted that tweet. The Mary Sue article blamed it on the Honey Badgers' sinister plans to infiltrate the con. Let me go read the fundraiser page that was used as a source for that. We plan to infiltrate nerd culture, cunningly disguised as their own. Each of us has been carefully crafting a persona of nerdiness through decades of dedication to comics, science fiction, fantasy, comedy games, and other geekery. Waiting for this moment, our moment, to slip among the unaware. So if your sarcasm detector is busted, I'll fill you in. This is a joke. Finally, the Expo settled on this non-committal tweet as the reason for kicking them out, and stopped making further statements on the matter. Twitter exploded in the other direction. Visiting the Calgary Expo hashtag, it was flooded with pro Honey Badger tweets. So what's the circumstance like now? As of when this video is made, Calgary Expo has still not clarified which rules or policies were violated, they're keeping the booth fee, they're silent on social media about the issue, and haven't made any further announcements to media outlets. They've banned the Honey Badgers from all future conventions and all other conventions under the same management. Allison made a video describing her perspective. The story goes that security staff approached them and ordered them to leave, and refused to give a reason when they noticed that the conversation was being recorded. Allison agreed to speak with them separate from the group, and they claimed that they had had complaints about harassment on social media. No specific issues were cited. They also brought up their quote-unquote disruptive behavior on the panel the day before. As I said, the tweets were unfounded guilt by association with Gamergate bullshit, and the harassment on the panel was disproven by recordings. The only accusation that seems to have stuck is that they used the wrong information on the sign-up forms. These forms are private right now, so this is all he said, she said. But the Honey Badger's story is that they used her Xenospora contact information when first signing up for the booth online. Xenospora is Allison Tiemann's comic, and they weren't sure what the booth would focus on at that point in time. Once they had such a large outpouring of support for the Honey Badger Brigade to be there, they updated the form and switched the information over to be the Honey Badger details instead. All except the email, which they left as the Xenospora email address by mistake. They claimed that they sent emails to the right people at the event to notify them that they made these changes. The current reason that I see quoted seems to be that the Honey Badger Brigade was ejected due to their fudging this paperwork and being misleading. Again, at this point in time, this is just word against word. And my bias makes me more likely to believe the Badgers than the Expo. As this develops, think for yourself about what happened and why. More evidence will come forward. It always does. So thanks for joining us for another recap. That's all I could squeeze into this one. Feel free to join Johnny D and I next time. Ciao!